Good morning. Our passage this morning is from Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. This is God's word for us today. You may be seated. Thank you, Lee. Good morning. I'm Pastor Brooks, lead pastor here at Grace, and we are continuing a series called Choose to Belong. And we have been camped out. Some of you are like, man, you cover scriptures so slowly. Well, it's kind of like slow cooking meat. The slower, the better. And that's why we're doing this. We're looking at Ephesians chapter 4 to understand not only who we are in Christ, but who we are together as a body of Christ, that we cannot uh, and dare not attempt to live the, our life in Christ apart from one another. And, and here's, the, here's the problem. In America, especially in the West, that's the thing that a lot of people attempt because that's part of our cultural DNA, this individual, rugged, Western pursuit of happiness all on my own. I don't need other people unless they can help me desire or get what I want. And, and that's, that's just not helpful. It's contrary to the gospel. It's contrary to scripture. So we're looking at Ephesians chapter 4 to that end. I want to start with a question, and that question is, what unites people? Last week, we looked at uh, Ephesians chapter 4, and we, we looked at really just verse 3, where Paul says that as we, as we live in a life worthy of the manner that we've been called to maintain unity. So I want to ask the question, I want to ask the question, what is it that unites people? I mean, think about that. What unites you as a family, if, you're, if you have a family? What unites a church? What unites, a, what unites a marriage? What unites a nation? What unites a nation? It's, it's interesting. You can, uh, Jason mentioned the uh, con- kingdoms and conflict uh, discussion uh, evenings, and yes, we will be discussing politics a little bit, um, but every candidate, national candidate, that ever presents themselves always presents themselves as the, I'm the candidate that can bring unity. Who buys this? Does anybody buy this? In, in fact, we're at a place right now, it's common for candidates to, to present themselves in such a way or present this, this coming election as this is the most important election or this is a very important, this is a historic, that's not new. Every candidate, every four years, it's always the most important election. Although this year it's different. It's not just that this is the most important election, that this election is the election that could determine whether or not our democracy continues. So it's, the ante is, is way up. So obviously, what does that mean? Well, it certainly has illustrated the fact that we live in divided times. We are definitely not united. Both candidates are saying the other one is an existential threat to our democracy. That, that's just, just read the news I know it's depressing, but if you, if you follow it, it's like constantly, if you vote for them, the country is going to dissolve. I and I alone and my party, I can unite the nation. Really. I'm skeptical. I'm skeptical. We're going to look at the ties that bind. We're going to look at, and, and, and that's just illustrative as we enter the, the sermon. We're not talking about national politics in this message. We're talking about real unity that actually binds people together. Not, not just temporary unity when we have a common enemy or a common goal and we can help one another get there. The kind of ties that actually bind, which are, which are, which are glue, which, are, which, which don't break apart. So three things we're going to see. We're going to see who we were. You're, you're going to find this familiar because it's, 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 it's repetitive. We've done this before. Who we were when we were not in Christ, 
who we are now in Christ, and then now that we're in Christ, what actually binds us? Because Paul says maintain, we looked at this last week, to work hard, to be quick about, make every effort to maintain the unity. If we're going to maintain unity, we have to understand what binds us together. What binds us together. So please open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4. And let us go to the Lord and ask him to unify our hearts and unify our minds. Father, we come together. We are totally dependent on your spirit. Apart from you, we are dead in our sins. Apart from you, we cannot understand, let alone apply your word for us. We thank you, Lord, that you have taken our sins to the cross. We thank you that you have given us your spirit. And spirit, we ask you to illuminate our hearts and our minds as we open up your scriptures, your gospel, that we might live for you who died for us, that we might understand what we have been united to in Christ, one another, with you, and Father, help us to live in light of the calling that we've received. We pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, first of all, who we were, we're backing it up. I, I recognize that we've taken a look at this verse more than a few times, but if you've ever drilled anything, whether it's playing piano uh, whether it's shooting free throws, whatever it is, you know that repetition's not a bad thing, it's a good thing. So we need to understand who we once were apart from Christ. And this will help us understand typically how everyone in the world views maintaining unity when you don't know Jesus. So let's take a look at this. Here we go. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked following the course of this world following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. So that is a universal statement that describes every human being born on this planet except Jesus, who is born dead in sin. This is a universal description I'm not going to break this down word by word, verse by verse, because I've already done that a number of times in the last few sermons. But that's a collective description of humanity. Make sense? So now take a look at that and take a look at that and think people like that. Now, some of you are still there. Some of you, that describes your current state because you are not yet in Christ yet. Hopefully by the end of this morning, that will be different. But this is where everyone starts. So think about this, a group of people that that's what describes them and that's their DNA and that's who they are, what unites them? If you're in a marriage where two people are like that, what unites your marriage? I've never performed a marriage where the couple states in premarital that it's their goal to remain together as long as they both make each other happy. No one says that. But that's typically, oftentimes, what happens. They start out unified until they're not. I mean, this is just reality. So what characterizes, what, what constitutes the, the, the ties that bind in a, in a union where people have that nature? And then that's, that's a marriage. How about, how about a, a, a business or, or, or even harder to maintain unity, a national government? When people are like that, what unifies them? What binds us together? A common pursuit. That's what unifies people when they're not one in Christ. A common pursuit. This is from the Declaration of Independence. It should look familiar. Thomas Jefferson wrote these words, We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they're endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I'm just ready to strike up to get the band back up here and we'll sing Lee Greenwood's God Bless the USA, right? I mean, this is, this is good patriotic stuff. This is Fourth of July stuff. This is what our nation is about. And, and I'm not disparaging this because it's, it's a great statement and it's true, but there's something in there there's something in there which, which demonstrates that connection to Ephesians 2, 1 through 3. What unites us as a people is 
the common pursuit of happiness. I know that may sound cynical, but I don't think that it is. I think that's just reality. And, and here's what this looks like. When we are pursuing happiness, we will find and align ourselves with individuals who will aid us in our pursuit of individual happiness. Is this true? It's like the, I've never watched the show, but Survivor. <laughs> I, we got a fan. Okay, I, I've, I've been, I kind of think I understand the premise. In order to, in order to win, you, you form temporary alignments with people to, that will help you gain what you want in your pursuit of happiness. That's how it works. And so every couple that's ever been married finds this beautiful person who, who, who they quote unquote fall in love with. And what do we mean by fall in love before, before we understand what love is? What, what we mean by that is that we love the way we feel when they're around us. They help us in our pursuit of happiness and we feel that we need to be united with them to achieve said happiness until they no longer make us happy. So at best, these are temporary alignments. And it's not just with marriage, it's with all things. It's with all things. Uh, it, it's, it's in political alliances. You make political alliances with someone that you loathe because they will help you get what you want and will advance your team ahead. Is this not the way it works? In order to pursue happiness, we will co-opt a journey with others so that we can obtain said happiness. That's just the way it works. There's something else. There's something else that'll unite people that are not naturally united. It's not there, but it's implied, and that's a common enemy. If there is an invader or if there is an entity which threatens the happiness that we have or prevents us from getting the happiness that we think that we need, then we will unite, even with people that we can't stand or groups that we disagree with, to defend ourselves or eliminate said enemy. When was America most united within the last, I don't know, 30, 40 years? September 12th, right after the two towers collapsed. Immediately, we had a common enemy. Before that, the nation was at each other's throats, over the election. Do you remember the hanging chad? That was the thing. So, and then all of a sudden, the towers fell, and it's Lee Greenwood. He is just, it's all of this. It's just like patriotic. We are united. Why? Because of Osama bin Laden. We had a common enemy that was in the way of our pursuit of happiness. And what's the problem with this? This type of unity. It never lasts. It never lasts. You know, Churchill and Stalin, they align, uh, or Roosevelt and Churchill align with Stalin to defeat Hitler, and then as soon as Hitler's gone, well, now Stalin, and you get it. And this is the way it works in marriages, it's the way they work in families, it's the way they work in business. Unfortunately, it is oftentimes is the way it works in churches. That's as, as good as it's going to get. The only unity that we're going to have is when we are following something, when we believe a person or a group can help us attain what we think we need to be happy. And if it sounds cynical, it's not. I don't think it is cynical be because it's just based on common experience and the way the world works when we're not united in Christ. So that moves us to the second point. Who are we? in Christ. And how does that change things? So later in, in Ephesians chapter 2, again, we've covered this in a few weeks back, for by grace, that is a free gift. It's the free gift of God that you and I have been saved through faith, through faith. And that's not of our own doing. It's a gift of God. It's not a result of anything that you and I have done so that no one can boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So you and I, according to Jesus, we were all dead in our trespasses and sins, and we used to be slaves. Jesus said in John chapter 8, 
that all who sin are slaves to sin. And the truth, if we, if we are his disciples, the truth will truly set us free. So we were all used to be dead in our sin and slaves. But we've been set free. We've been made alive in Christ. We've been made alive in Christ. And we are now new creations in Christ. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, uh, five verses sixteen and seven uh, verse sixteen and seventeen. Paul says, "From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come." Okay, there's a before and after. There's a before and after. I want you to see it. So before, union was based on a common pursuit that's going to make us happy. Right. And we would view people according to whether or not they will increase or decrease our happiness quotient. And we'll remain united as long as we think they'll make us happy. The moment we sniff out that they're going to make our lives unhappy, even if it's temporarily, we cut ties. Those ties no longer bind. That's just the way people are. And that's what it means, what does Paul say? Even though we, we no longer regard people according to the flesh, that's what it means to regard people according to the flesh. You look at individuals, I look at individuals in the context of, will they or will they not make me happy? If they will, I'll journey with them. If they won't, peace out. I'm gone. That's what we do. But Paul says, because we've been made new creations, because we are now been made alive in Christ and we're united to him, we don't view people that way anymore, although we once regarded Christ that way. What do you mean by that? Think about people who are dead in their trespasses and sins. The old way. It's not that they're atheists. It's that they, they view God as a means to an end. They view people as a means to an end. They'll help me achieve what I want in my pursuit of happiness. And they call on God to pursue their happiness. Again, we're not a nation full of atheists. We're just a nation full of people dead in their trespasses and sins. And so as such, people viewed Christ according to the flesh. He will help me get me what I want. But still dead in their trespasses and sins. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. A new creation in Christ. You view no one according to the flesh. So that brings us up to speed. Now we're in the present text that we're looking at this morning. So Paul says, I therefore, prison Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience. Bearing one another with, with one another in love, eager to, here it is, maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Now, as we talked about last week, as the Scripture reveals here, you cannot maintain what you do not already have. We do not create unity. We simply maintain it. Maintain it. Now, we're going to move into this morning's text. We're going to spend the rest of the time just looking at verses 4, 5, and 6 because there is a lot there. There's a lot there. What actually binds us? So what are we to maintain? What is it that unites us? And it's no longer a pursuit of happiness. That's, that's old. That's yesterday's news. I'm not saying that Christ is opposed to our happiness. Let's just get that out of the way. Some of you are thinking... Oh, yeah, I know where this is going. He's going to talk about self-denial now. He's going to talk about discipleship and how much it sucks and how hard it is and how hard we have to work. No, there is discipline, there is discipleship, and there is self-denial. But don't confuse that with sucking. That's, that's not it. These are, these are, Jesus says, I came that you might have life and that you might have it abundantly. Jesus said in John chapter 15, I came to give you joy, my joy, so that your joy would be complete. So your pursuit of happiness, my pursuit of happiness is not at odds 
with a pursuit of holiness. In fact, you cannot have joy lasting and happiness uh, in, with depth, any kind of depth, unless you are united in Christ and you are, you are working to maintain that unity, which is not a pursuit of, of happiness. The pursuit of happiness leads to misery. The pursuit of Christ leads to happiness. See, if you pursue happiness apart from Christ, you may attain it temporarily, but you'll never hold on to it. But if you pursue Christ in unity with those you've been united with, you will experience true joy and ultimately happiness. So they're not mutually exclusive. Just a little point, thought I better get that out of the way before we get going. All right, here we go. What unites us? There are seven Seven things that Paul lists as things which we are united in. Seven. It's a perfect number in Scripture. Seven things. First of all, there is one body. One body. Now, he doesn't elaborate on this because he's already elaborated on this. We see this in, in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22. Paul says, and he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, wait for it, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. You remember John chapter 15 where Jesus says, I'm the vine and you are the branches. If you remain in me and my word remains in you, you will bear much fruit. You remember that? That's a metaphor, and so is the body. We've been grafted into the vine. In like ways, we have been grafted or united into Christ's body. And there's one head, and the head is not the lead pastor of a local church. There's one chief shepherd. His name is Jesus. And all of us are members of that body with various gifts, talents, and abilities, which, which we're going to talk about as we get through the rest of Ephesians chapter 4. We are one church. We're one people now. Before, Paul says in chapter 2, before you weren't a people. You were Gentiles. You had no covenants. You had no promises. You didn't have the law. And you, you, were, you, you were not. You were alienated. But because of what Christ has done on the cross, he's tore down the wall of hostility. He's brought these two individuals together, these two people together, the Jews and the Gentiles, and he's made them one. And that one entity is now called the church or his body. Did you know right now that you have more in common with the people sitting on your right or your left or in this room, even if you've never met them, even if they are from a different country than you do with your own flesh and blood, if your own flesh and blood is not in Christ? That is a hard and a fast truth. You are unified with them. You are one with them. You may have not met them yet, but they are your family. They're part of you. You're a part of them. Your individuality has not left. You don't, it's, it's, it's not like you drop, you're a, a drop that goes into the ocean, you become part of the ocean and you cease to exist. You're just part of the ocean. That, that's not it. You are individual, you are distinct, but you and I are now part of the body. So there is one body and there is one spirit. There is one spirit that speaks of the Holy Spirit. This Holy Spirit in, in chapter one, again, Ephesians Verse 13, Paul says, I'll back it up to verse 11. In him, that is Christ, we've obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. Verse 13, in him, you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, you were sealed with the promise of, Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire the possession of it to the praise of our glory. The Spirit is what caused you and I to move from death to life. You remember when, when, when Jesus called Lazarus out of the tomb? 
Some of you are like, I don't remember, I wasn't there. When you read it in scripture, you watched The Chosen, the last season, right? When you saw Lazarus come out, how does someone who is dead suddenly walk and, and come alive? By the work of the Spirit, how does someone who is spiritually dead, being dead in the trespasses and sins in which they used to walk, having no interest in Christ, viewing everyone else in Jesus according to the flesh, how do they all of a sudden become animated, regenerate by the Spirit? The Spirit indwells, animates, regenerates, brings life where is this, there's death, and now Paul even says seals, guarantees. It's the deposit. The, the, the word means earnest money. Do you know what earnest money is? It means God puts a deposit down guaranteeing that you and I will never be lost. The Spirit indwells. He's not leaving you. He animates you. One spirit. The spirit of Christ. The spirit of the living God. And just as you were called to one hope. One hope. Also back in chapter 1. Verse 18. Having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, Paul is praying that they would have the eyes of their hearts enlightened, that you may know the hope to which he has called you. And then he elaborates that. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places? Stop right now and just ask yourself a question. Close your eyes and think. What's your greatest hope? What's your greatest longing? What do you want more than anything else? What are you pursuing? As you pursue happiness, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, what do you believe that if you, if you, could, just, if you could just get it, your life would be worthwhile? What is it? What is it you're chasing after? What do you hope in? Here's what Paul's saying. You already have it in Christ. You already have it. Everything you think you need to be fulfilled and happy, your health, beauty, wealth, all of these things is all going to fade away anyway. All of it. All of it. I remember sharing a verse with someone when I was flat on my back the day before my surgery. I was talking about all that God was teaching me. And I, it was Romans 5, 3 through 5. He says, rejoice or boast in your sufferings. For your sufferings produce endurance. And your endurance produces character. And your character produces hope. And hope does not disappoint us. And I remember this person saying, I never liked that verse. And I get where they were coming from. They, they, they kind of they were implying that it, it seems like God is saying that unless I beat you with suffering, you'll never grow. So I have to beat you. I mean, that, that's awful if you look at it that way. That's not what the verse says. But here's the, the truth. The truth is, Ephes, or rather, uh, Hebrews chapter 5, the author says that Christ learned obedience through suffering. So here's the deal. If he's not exempt, I'm not. Suffering produces endurance, endurance produces character, character produces hope. Okay, here's the thing. Logically, we get that suffering produces endurance. That's, that's not hard. If anybody's trained for anything physically, you know that no pain, no gain, right? So you got to suffer for endurance to grow. And you, you also know that endurance, well, I can see how endurance leads to character. Character is the testing of, of your faith and you know, you, you become a stronger person, a better person as you endure and so forth and so on. That makes sense. But how does character produce hope? How does character produce this one hope that belongs to your call? Here's how it works. We know intellectually that Jesus is our one hope. Yeah, whatever. But my real hope is my 401k. But my real hope is a hot wife or a husband that actually picks up his underwear. That's my real hope. My real hope is X, Y, and Z. And yes, I know Jesus is a part of it, but that's not, yeah, until suffering. 
And then one by one, those things, you recognize they're temporal, they can't last, they won't last, and after a lifetime of enduring, you're like, no, I'm ready for Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus, the sooner the better. I never prayed that way in my 30s. I know that the old timers did, but I didn't. I get it now. And I haven't arrived. I'm still on this journey. Suffering, enduring, growing character, refining hope. Because hope does not disappoint. And here's what Paul's saying. You already have it in Christ. You just aren't banking on it yet, necessarily. But you have it. Oops, got ahead of myself. And one Lord. One Lord. This doesn't really need explanation. Who's the one Lord? The Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. For there, Paul, or rather Peter says, there is only one name under heaven and on earth by which men must be saved. And his name is Jesus. Jesus said in John chapter 4, 14, verse 6, I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He says, I'm the narrow way, I'm the door, I'm the bread of life, I'm living water. I am, I am, I am, I am. He is the Lord of life. He's the master. He's the Lord. One Lord. One faith. One faith. This could mean two different things. There's an objective way to look at this, and there's a subjective way to look. The objective is the truths about who Jesus is. We've been saved by grace through faith. That faith is a collective body of evidence, historical data points about the person and work of Jesus Christ. That, those are the truths about who Jesus is, what he did, and what he accomplished. That's objective. It could also mean the, the faith that we possess in those things. So it could be one or both, I'm not sure, but the point is no one is saved except by grace through faith. And that faith is in the person and work of Jesus Christ. There is no other faith that will save. I remember when I first came to college and I first had a conversation with someone who was a believer and I, I said something stupid, which actually it seems logical at the time. It seemed logical. I won't say it's stupid. It's just misinformed. It shows that I didn't know the Bible. I said, well, I, don't, I said, I don't think it really matters what you believe, just as long as you're sincere in what you believe. Does that sound familiar? Does anyone really believe that? No, you don't. No one believes that. You might believe it spiritually in terms of things of heaven, but no one applies that to life. I don't really believe it matters what you believe in terms of what you put in your body to cure yourself of this disease, just as long as you believe that it's going to work. That's a good way to get killed. Nobody does that. I, I don't really know where I'm going, but I'm sincere in my getting there, so that's all that really matters. So if I want to go to city A, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna go wherever I think I need to go and not gonna look at a map because I think I can get... No, that's not how life works. It's not how faith works. One baptism. One baptism. Jesus says in Acts chapter 1, verse 5, when... He says, I want you to go to Jerusalem. I want you to wait until you're empowered from on high for, for you will be baptized in the Holy Spirit. John says to John the Baptist, says that you've been baptized with water, but there is going to be someone who comes who is going to baptize you with fire and the Holy Spirit. So which is it? One baptism. Are you talking about the one water baptism or the one spirit baptism? Water baptism points to the spirit baptism. So it is just one baptism. I'm going to turn to uh, Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. Paul asks a rhetorical question. That's not Romans 6. That's 1 Corinthians. Try again, Brooks. I put these little tabs in my Bible so I can get there quickly, and then I don't know how I got to the wrong book, but that's not the right one. Here we go. Paul says, so what do we say then? Are we to continue to sin that grace may abound? In chapter 5, he's ended chapter 5 with grace. Where sin abounds, grace superabounds. Much more abounds. You can't out-sin grace. 
which leads to a logical question. So are you saying that I should sin, that grace should increase? Paul's like, no, that's not what I mean. Okay. And he says, by no means, how can we who died to sin live in it? Or don't you know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ, that's an important phrase, into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. We were buried, therefore, with his bapt- him and by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by glory of the Father, we too may walk in the newness of life. What is Paul saying? Your baptism, my baptism, signifies how we've been united to Christ. I was saved in 1988. I was baptized nine months later, and my baptism did not save me, but here's what it communicated. It communicated to my father, to my mother, to my sister, to everyone who was watching that I, Brooke Simpson, no longer lived. But I had been united to Christ in his death. His death became vicariously my death. And his life became vicariously my life. And when I was dunked in and then I came up, I came up a new creation in Christ because the spirit which sealed me, which indwells me, which is earnest money or a deposit guaranteeing the, the, the redemption to come, all of those things are now true in me and I am fundamentally a changed human being. And that is my one baptism. And that is what it says. That's who I am now. And if you are in Christ, that's what your baptism signifies. And if you haven't been baptized, you need to be baptized. Not so that you can be saved, but that other people know that you are united with Christ. And in being united with Christ, if they are Christians, you are united to them. Being baptized says, I'm your brother. You and I are related with bonds thicker than blood. Even if I don't know your name, and most of you, I don't. But that's the beauty of the body of Christ. One baptism. And lastly, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Do you know, I love this, I'm going to butcher the quote, but I I thought it was fascinating. I never looked at it this way. You know where uh, Jesus in the Great Commission He says, all authority has been granted unto me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you and baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And behold, I am with you always to the very end of the age. You remember remember that whole thing? And baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I remember reading Dallas Willard when I was on sabbatical. And Dallas said, that doesn't mean that you just get wet and say the name of Jesus. It means that you and I, through our union with Christ, have been baptized into communion and fellowship with the triune God. One God. Not three, one. One God. One Father of all. Who is overall. We're talking about the sovereign creator of the universe. And through all and and in all. Because the Spirit now indwells you, because of your union with Christ, that same God who separated the light from the darkness, who called all of creation into existence, who called his Son from the grave and gave him the Spirit by the power of the Spirit, that same God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you and I, through our union with Christ, which our baptism signifies, We've been baptized, that means literally immersed into fellowship. That's a different kind of union than the pursuit of happiness. Our nation may go up in flames the second week of November. That union will not be touched. Do you understand that? If that's true, nothing can shake your hope. Your health could be gone tomorrow. 
You could lose the people you love most. You could lose your wealth. The economy could collapse. Everything that we pursue in the pursuit of happiness could all be gone and probably will be eventually. Except that. Except that. That's the union. That's the union that we have. And here's the irony. When you settle on that, you will have joy that you don't currently have. You will. Even in the midst of your suffering. <laughs> even in the midst of your endurance. Even in the midst of gut-wrenching loss and pain. That doesn't change. But you need one another. You have to choose to walk in that union. You have to choose to maintain that union. You have to choose to walk in the manner worthy of the calling you've received. If you passively walk out of this building and you do nothing to grow in your faith, you will not enjoy the union that has been secured for you. And here's the irony. You might be united in Christ, but you won't experience the union. You won't experience the joy until you start living in light of that joy and living in light of that union. So three questions and we'll close. First of all, are you in Christ? I do not assume that you are. It would be foolish to do so. Do you know how many people grow up in church not being united to Christ? I didn't ask if you were raised in the church. I don't care if you were raised in the church. It does not matter. D.L. Moody, one of the most famous evangelists in the world, about 150 years ago, said that the greatest source, the greatest pool for evangelism is the people in the pews, dead in their sins, presuming that they know Jesus. Your Growing up in church doesn't make you united with Christ. Your repentance for your sins and trusting in what he's done on the cross for you unites you with him. So repent. Turn from your sins. Turn to Jesus who is a benevolent savior. You don't have to reform yourself. You simply have to receive the grace that he's given that comes through faith. Are you in community? Are you in community? Do you have people in your life that know you well enough to call you out? Do you have people that know you well enough to know that something's wrong in your life and you need encouraged? Do you have people that know you well enough to come alongside you and pray over you and for you when you can't pray for yourself because you don't have the strength? I could not Take a step forward in my faith without you. And you can't take a step forward and enjoy the unity which Christ has secured for you without one another. And here is the bane of our Western Christian. We are consumers who choose churches the same way we choose Chick-fil-A Sunday after church. That's not what it means to be a part of the body of Christ. You, you can't do this without each other. So take a step of faith and risk becoming known. Jason's already given you a bunch of ways at the beginning of the service. If you're like, I, okay, I wasn't listening to Jason, I was just waiting for the message. <laughs> Take out your phone, capture the QR code in front of you, and let us know that you want to get connected. And then lastly, do you need prayer? Do you need prayer? Some of you are suffering. Some of you are enduring. You don't think you can make it. Some of you feel alone. Some of you are, are physically impaired. There could be any number of reasons. Some of you are spiritually stifled. You don't have the strength to pray for yourself. Any number of things encourage you. After the benediction, when we dismiss, come forward, there'll be people to pray over and for you. Would you please stand as we read?
Ephesians 3 for our benediction. Paul says, for this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family on heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, that he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all of the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth, and know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, according to the power at work within, within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. God bless, go in grace, and we'll see you next week. <laughs>